a lot Hung, for the introduction. So it's a pleasure to see you again, although I don't see you uh, very much, but uh, it's a pleasure anyway. So let me remind you of what we did uh, last time. So last time we discussed Coulomb and risk acids. And um, we will concentrate in this lecture uh, on the zero temperature case, which is much easier to state uh, and also somewhat closer uh, to a variation of methods in, in spirit. And the uh, last time I tried to explain to you, uh, so I gave you many examples, many physical examples of uh, situations where such gases appear either because uh, they are charged particles and then they must be described by the Coulomb potential, but also many other situations where Ries and Coulomb uh, interactions naturally pop up. So today I will start again directly with uh, where we were last time. So last time we uh, were studying the short range case. So let me remind you of what uh, we are doing now. So I pick a domain omega, so a bounded domain. I mean, a nice domain, an open set, but a very nice boundary and so on. Omega in RD. D is uh, any uh, integer. Of course, physically, we are more interested in dimension one, two, three, but uh, sometimes it's useful to look at any dimension just to, to have an idea of uh, what can happen in a high dimension compared to low dimension anyway. Okay, so omega is a bounded set in RD. And then in omega, I'm just putting n points. I'm calling their positions xj, so x1 up to xn. I put them in omega bar. Okay, in the closure of omega. And then what I do is I minimize the pairwise interaction between these points with the RIS potential. What does it mean? It means that I sum over all pairs. So here is the sum of our pairs of points of one over the distance between uh, the two points in my pair to the power S. And here we are discussing the short range case which is when S is a strictly larger than the, the space dimension D. What we want to do is we want to look at a situation where we have infinitely many points living in the whole space. And so what we do, we will increase the set omega. And at the same time, we will increase the number of points. And we want to have finitely many points per unit volume in the limit. So we will fix uh, the density, which is the number of points divided by the volume. And this I call rho, which is any positive fixed number. As I explained last time, in fact, this rho doesn't play any role. I can always assume that rho is one if I want, because I have this exact scaling relation, which comes from the fact that my potential is homogeneous of degree minus x. Okay, so I can just scale out. And then if I want, I can choose rho equals one. Usually I like to keep rho because I like to see how things depend on rho, but the proofs, I, I, I can always assume that rho is one if I know. And then the, we discussed last time this uh, lemma, which says um, that uh, the energy per unit volume, or if you prefer the energy per particle, it's a bit the same, is bounded away from zero. So it's a positive number bounded away from zero and also bounded from above by some constants which have to be rho to the one plus s over d by scaling because of what I said above. Okay, so this tells us that the energy per particle, per particle would be when you divide by n and then you would have rho to the s over d on the left and on the right, or the energy per unit volume, which is when you divide by the volume, then you have one rho in addition on both sides. I will always uh, look at the energy per unit volume for convenience, okay, is uh, bounded and so, the next natural question is whether there exists a limit when my omega grows and n grow so, uh, so as to make sure that the density is fixed. So that's the, the main theorem which I want to discuss. Uh, and I don't know why my theorem doesn't show up. Anyway, uh, but what is happening? Oh, no, sorry, confused. Here is the theorem. Okay, so assume that you are in the short range case. So S is bigger than D. And then I'm going to look at a very special way of increasing omega. I mean, definitely, if you take a crazy sequence of domains, 
then it will not work. Imagine that you take a very thin sequence, uh, which uh, grows very fast in one dimension and very slowly in other dimensions, then it might not work well. But uh, so here, what I do is I take a fixed omega, actually any open bounded set of volume one. I assume that the boundary has zero Lebesgue measure, and then I scale it. Okay, so my omega is just going to be a fixed omega, which then I scale. And the scaling factor I call L. Okay. And the theorem says then that the limit exists. So if I look at the energy of n points, the minimal energy of n points in this rescaled omega, I divide by the volume, which is just L to the D. I take n to infinity and I assume that n divided by the volume converges to some to my positive constant rho. Then this goes to a constant, which I call E of S times rho to the one plus S over D, which I know must, uh, so that's the way it must depend on rho because of scale. Okay, so the main point of this theorem is that the limit exists and it does not depend on omega. So it does not depend on the way that I do uh, my limit. Such a limit is called a thermodynamic limit and it really says that your infinite system exists and doesn't depend on the way that you construct. So you see that we are interested in this constant E of S. And if you remember the crystallization conjecture, which I stated for you uh, last time, then the energy per unit volume uh, must converge to uh, something which I can compute for lattices because I conjecture that those are lattices. So in general, this E of S is unknown, except in dimensions one, eight and 24. So in dimension one, we know that E of S is equal to the Riemann zeta function of S, okay? Which is just saying that my points are sitting on, a, on an infinite lattice, which is just Z, if you work at density one, okay? So they are just sitting on, on a, all uh, integers. And then when you compute uh, for such a lattice, uh, the energy that you get, you just get the Riemann zeta. This was proved way back in 78 by uh, Vante Rocher. And then there are very recent and actually very famous works in dimensions eight and 24, where uh, Marina Vyazovska and co-workers could prove that you also get a, a kind of zeta function, but associated with some special lattices. So the E8 in dimension eight and the Leach lattice in dimension 24. And then you get also this uh, what's called Epstein zeta function. Okay, so these are the only situations where we know for sure the value of E of S. And then I can reformulate the crystallization conjecture at the level of the energy, which is just saying that E of S must be the, the Epstein zeta function of some lattice. So it must be given by this formula here for some lattice. Uh, of density one, of course, I forgot to write, okay, because E of S is what you get when you are at row equals one. Okay. In principle, this lattice could depend on S. So it could be that for, so for large S, you get some lattice, and then suddenly you prefer to get another lattice. In dimension two, it's predicted that L of S should not depend on S and must in fact be the triangular lattice. And in dimension three, it's also predicted that L should not depend on S and it must be the face center cubic lattice, which is when you take a cubic lattice and then you add one point at each center of each face. Okay, and that's also the same lattice which gives you the best uh, sphere packing. So this is saying that somehow in 3D for all S uh, strictly larger than three, then it's always the same lattice which is optimal and that's the, the sphere packing lattice. Uh, I have to tell you that it's a little bit unclear if this conjecture uh, should be right in high dimensions. People believe for sure that it's true in low dimensions, but in high dimensions, it's a little bit unclear. So there are uh, some uh, predictions um, by, uh, by physicists, uh, particular by uh, Torquato and uh, Stillinger about what could happen in high dimensions. Okay. So here, 
the theorem I stated is much older. It's due to uh, Ruel and Fisher in the 60s. And it's just about the existence of a limit without saying what the limit is. Of course, it's much more complicated to identify the value of, the, of E of X. So how do you show very quickly, how do you show that uh, the limit exists without knowing what it is? It's um, somehow using some kind of subadditivity properties. Okay, so let me remind you, because of the lemma I, I told you, let me remind you that the energy per unit volume, you know, it's uniformly bounded. It's bounded away from zero and bounded away, bounded from above as well. We can always work at density one, so we can assume that n is L to the D. And so the only thing you have to do is to prove that the limb soup is less than the limb inf, and then that will prove that the limit exists. Of course, you also have to show that it's, that it's independent of omega. So the proof goes like that. I'm not going to do it, but I will just quickly explain the main idea. So you take your domain omega. So here it is. And then you just tile omega with cubes. So you have to imagine that my omega is very big. And then I tile it with big cubes. The cubes are big, but still much smaller than omega. So there's a little l, which is the size of the cubes. This little l is going to be large, but much less than the big l, which is the size of the big domain. And then in each small cube, you just put the, your points at, the, at their minimal uh, configuration. Okay, so in each small cube, you take the points and put them at their minimal configurations for the small cube. And you use this as a trial state for the big domain. Okay, in this way, you will get an upper bound on E of N in the large domain. So the upper bound will be of the form that there will be the number of cubes uh, times the energy of each cube, it's all the same, okay? And then there will be the interaction between the cubes. So the interaction between the cube is uh, what you have to control in this proof. How do you control the interaction between the cube? Well, the first thing you have to do is to make sure the cubes are not too close because you don't know the optimal position of the, of the points inside the small cube. And actually there will be points at the boundary for sure. And so if the cubes touch, then that could be very bad. So what you do is you insert some kind of security corridors between the cubes, and I'm calling delta the size of these security corridors. So that's the third scale. The idea is that delta is also going to be big, but it's going to be much smaller than L, which itself is much smaller than capital L. And then if you compute everything carefully, I'm not going to do it, but it's not very hard you get these kind of error terms coming essentially from the interaction between the cubes. Also from the fact that close to the boundary, I can't put any cubes, so there is some missing space. And also from the fact that the density is not quite right, since I have a lot of empty space also between the cubes, so you get these three error terms. Now what you do, you divide by L to the D and you take the limb soup, which you want to estimate from above. And so what you have shown is that the limb soup for any domain is less than the energy of a cube with this little l plus these error terms. And of course, the main point here is that you can make these error terms small. Why can, can you do that? That's because delta, you see you have delta to the power s and here delta over l. So if you want to make this uh, small, the on, it will only work if uh, s is strictly larger than d. Okay, so in fact, the optimal delta is of that order. And so this is going to be large and be much smaller than L only when S is strictly larger than D. Okay, so what you do is you estimate the limb soup of any domain by the limb inf of the cube. Okay, so you have an upper bound on the limb soup of any domain by the limb inf of the cube. And then if omega is itself a cube, that definitely gives the theorem for cubes. So you know that the limit exists for cubes. And then what you do, you show that the limit for cube actually works for all omega. Okay, so you, you already have shown an upper bound. So now you have to prove a bound in the other direction. And the way to do that is uh, as uh, shown in this picture. So now you take your big omega. And what you do is you take a very large cube, which are essentially a volume comparable to omega and you fill the missing space with small cubes. 
<coughs> okay, so here is your omega. Inside omega, you put your optimal positions, which you don't know. You fill the missing space with the smaller cubes. And then you do the same kind of estimates. And that will show you that the limit for small cubes is actually a lower bound to the limit for omega if you write everything carefully. And that will give you the theorem. Okay, so this theorem I have stated by assuming that I have one fixed omega, which I scale just to uh, simplify the statement, but actually this is working. If you have any sequence omega n which grows under some assumptions on the boundary, some of the boundary should not be too large because you see that the boundary appears here in all the error terms. And it comes from the fact that close to the boundary, I can't put my small cubes. Okay, so the same theorem works for any omega n growing under the assumption that the boundary is not too crazy. Very good. So this is the idea of the proof of the existence of the limit for the energy per unit volume and on the fact that it doesn't depend on omega. I would like to quickly explain to you the proof uh, of uh, crystallization at the level of the energy in 1D. So that's very easy. Uh, once, I mean, once you've seen the proof, it's easy. So it's, uh, it goes back to 78. And the proof uses the fact that one over x to the s is uh, convex. Okay, so let me uh, do the proof for you. It's just this one slide. And this proof actually works for any convex non-increasing function of the distance. Okay, so let me take, uh, so I work in uh, dimension one, so let me take an interval of size L, I'm taking zero L for simplicity, and then let me minimize, let me take N plus one points instead of N, it doesn't matter, of course, the limit is the same, the density is the same. So let me take N plus one points, X zero, X one, up to Xn in this interval, and I can assume that L is rho minus one times N if I want, or N plus one, it doesn't really matter. Now, because V is a decreasing function, then it's clear that I can always gain by putting the particle to the left exactly at zero and putting the particle to the right exactly at N that will decrease the energy. So I know that X zero is going at zero, it's going to be, to be at zero, and I know that Xn is, is going to be at, uh, L. And then I have x1, x2, and so on in the middle. I don't know where they are. Now, what is special about one dimension is that I can describe my system using not uh, the, I mean, not the, the positions of the points, but instead the distance between the points, because on the line, there is an order. That's the whole point. So let me call a1, a2, a3, and so on the distance between successive points in my system for a minimizer. Now, if you think a bit, the, the pairwise interaction of my points can be written in that way, where I look at all the interactions with the next point on the right, then all the interactions with the next two nearest point on the right, and so on and so forth. Okay, so, so I will get the sum of V of AJ. So that's this kind of red, uh, signs here, which is just the interaction between any point and the next one on the right. Then I also have the sum of V of AJ plus AJ plus one, which is now this green part, which is the interaction between any point and the, and the, and the two guys further away on the right, and so on and so forth. And of course, the last one is just V of N, which is the interaction between X0 and Xn. And now you use con convexity of V, okay? And you see it's really convexity with respect to the distances between the points, not with respect to, to the positions. For instance, for the first one, I know that the sum of the HAs is N, right? So I write uh, N times one over N and I use the convexity of V. So I get that this is larger than N times V of one over N, the sum of AJ, which is L, sorry, not N, L which is rho minus one times, times n. And then I do the same here. So here I have n minus one guy. So I get n minus one times V of one over n minus one, the sum. 
But this sum here, right? So I'm summing twice. I'm summing twice the distances, but somehow I'm missing some guys close to the boundary. Okay, so I'm not quite getting 2L, I'm getting something less than 2L, but I assume that V is uh, non-increasing. And so for sure, for a lower bound, I can replace this sum by 2L. And then I do the same for all the other terms, and I end up with the following series. So the sum from K1 to N of N minus K plus one, that's the number of terms for each of those guys, times V of K N rho minus one, this is L here, divided by N minus K plus one. Okay, I know the whole point is that for nice uh, potentials V, this behaves like N times the V of rho minus one K, which is what we want to show. Okay, so this corresponds to putting uh, points exactly on the lattice. Uh, and the size of the lattice depends on rho, which we have fixed from the beginning. Okay, so in our case, this sum actually is exactly equal to what I have written here, and it's pretty clear by some kind of uh, dominated convergence or whatever monotone convergence that this is exactly n times rho to the s times zeta in the limit. That's the lower bound, but the upper bound is obvious because for the upper bound, you just place exactly the points on, uh, on, on the lattice. And this is how you prove that E is zeta of S uh, in one dimension. So let me mention that there is a different proof, which is due to uh, Kohn and uh, Kumar, although one can also trace it back to Vante Rojan, okay, which uses uh, what's called linear programming bounds and it doesn't use at all the fact that V is convex in the distance, but rather that V is completely monotone in the distance square. Okay, so there are non-convex functions like Gaussians, which are completely monotone of X squared. So it's a slightly different proof. And it is this approach, uh, this different proof, which could be generalized to dimensions eight and 24. Okay. So now I'm going to speak about the grand canonical ensemble. So from the presentation I gave you, it seems very natural to fix the average density of points rho and then do the limit. But it, it turns out that this is not at all the easiest technically. Okay, so there, there, there's a trick uh, which is called in statistical physics, the grand canonical setting, which is going to allow us to tell us, I mean, to do much more. So what is the grand canonical ensemble? So what we will do, we will not um, fix exactly the density directly, but we will fix it uh, in an indirect way using a dual parameter mu. Okay, so let me now fix a mu. Okay, mu is any real number. And then I'm changing the energy. So I look at the same energy as before, but minus mu times the number of points. So I'm just doing a kind of Legendre transform, if you like, with respect to the, the number of points. Now what I do, I minimize over the positions, but I also minimize over the number of points. Okay, so I introduce this parameter mu, and now I minimize both over positions and over the number of points. As you can see, this is really a discrete Legendre transform. And then I'm going to describe my system not using the density rho, but using instead mu. And we will see that this is completely equivalent, but we will be able to say much more on uh, this uh, grand canonical problem. Okay, so it's pretty clear that if mu is negative, strictly or even when mu is negative, same, then the energy is, is positive, right, except if n is equal to zero. So I'm using the convention that when n is equal to zero, uh, this sum doesn't make sense, so I take zero. And I'm also using the convention that when n is equal to one, so I'm also using the convention that when n is equal to one, I cannot sum of a pair. So I'm also using that the energy is zero. Okay, so it's pretty clear then that if mu is negative, 
then you just do not want to put any point at all. Okay, so then the minimum is attained when n is equal to zero. Okay, so when mu is negative, it's obvious there will be no point. So you have to take mu positive. And when mu is positive, the idea is that now there is a competition between the first term, which is going to behave like a constant times n, as I, I have explained to you, and the second term, which is negative, which is mu times n, and then there will be some kind of uh, equilibrium between the two, and n will not uh, be zero anymore. And actually, n will want to be of the order of the volume. That's the idea. Okay, so what can I say about this new uh, problem, which I call Fs of mu and omega? Well, it also has some scaling, here it is. So if you like, you can always assume that mu is one because we always assume mu is positive. Otherwise it's obvious. The first lemma is that this is finite. Okay, so in a way, this is bounded. Um, so it's always attained at some finite n when n is very large little n is very large, this becomes positive, okay? And furthermore, for omega large enough, the volume large enough, then the minimum over n is attained for a number of points, which is of the order of the volume, times some obvious scaling factor, which here is mu to the d over. Okay, so this is saying that if you fix mu, but then you minimize over n, then the optimal n is going to be of the order of the volume. Okay, you don't quite know exactly uh, what it's going to do. This I will tell you in the next slide, but at least it's of the order of the volume. I mean, the proof is rather easy. I guess I'm not going to go through it. Uh, so maybe very quickly. So if you take little n equal to zero, it's clear that the f is a uh, one positive, okay? And so the E has to be less than N, but then let me remind you of the bounds we had on E. Let me show you the bounds again. All right, so we had these bounds here, okay, which tell you essentially that uh, E of N behaves like omega to some power times N to the power S over D or one plus S over D, sorry. Okay, so if you use these bounds, you just plug them in then you will be able to prove this small lemma. Okay, very good. So now let's do the, the limit of a growing omega as before. Now there's no n, the n is automatic. We don't know what it's doing, but let's do the limit. So let's take an omega, an omega, a domain omega, and let's make it grow to infinity. What will happen? So it's the following theorem. So let me assume again that uh, we are in the short range case. So S is strictly larger than D. Let me take a bounded set of volume one, which has no, um, I mean, no boundary. So a boundary of uh, zero measure. Let me fix mu. Okay, we are interested in positive mu, but let me fix any mu. Then the limit exists and it is the Legendre transform of the previous theorem namely of the map which to rho associates our constant E of S rho to the one plus S over D. It's not a big surprise that it's the Legendre transform of this function because we divide by the volume and here we also have a Legendre transform except it's discrete. Okay, but when you divide by the volume, N over the volume can now take any continuous value uh, in the limit, right? So you get a continuous Legendre transform in the limit because you divide by the volume. Okay, so the precise statement is that the limit of the capital F divided by the volume is the minimum over rho of rho to the one plus S over D times E minus mu times rho, which is this number here, okay? And furthermore, the optimal number of points will go to the corresponding rho of mu, so the optimum of this uh, minimization problem over rho, which is this value. Okay, so I am now fixing mu, but I know what the optimal number of points will do. It will have a certain density rho of mu given by this formula. It's an explicit formula, so I can easily invert it. So for instance, if you ask me 
to reproduce a given row, I know how to do it. I have to solve this equal to rho. That gives me a unit mu, which behaves like rho to the power s over d. Okay. And then I take that mu. I take this very special sequence uh, n uh, mu l. And then I know that the grand canonical problem will be uh, exactly uh, what I wanted. Namely, I will have points exactly at density rho. What do we gain? Well, what we gain is that we know more on those points right, in the grand canonical setting. So choosing rho of mu equals to rho, one gets one very special sequence, n mu l, such that this is going to rho, but it has additional properties. The additional properties is just that it solves this minimum, this, mini, this minimum here. So I know what is happening if I add one particle or if I remove one particle from the system. And this is going to be very helpful. So the proof of this theorem is very easy in our setting. It's also a very well-known theorem, but here for, um, I mean, for our problem, it's quite easy. Okay, so um, let, me, uh, let me go through quickly through the proof. So let's look at uh, the energy I mean, that's called the free energy, this F, because it's the energy minus mu times N, this is called the free energy. So I look at the free energy, I divide by the volume. This is just E of some NL, the optimum NL, okay, minus mu NL divided by the volume. Okay, but up to extraction of a subsequence, I can always assume that my NL divided by the volume goes to rho zero. This is because of the previous lemma, which told me that the optimal number of points is of the order of the volume. Okay, so it's bounded from below and from above by the volume. So I, by extraction, I can always assume it converges to something. And then if it converges to something, I know what's the limit. That's my first theorem. I get E of S times rho zero to the one plus S over D minus mu times rho zero. And of course, this here is bigger than if I do the minimum. So this tells me that the limb inf of my grand canonical problem is for sure larger or equal than the minimum. But on the other hand, now if you give me any row, I can find any uh, sequence of integers nl so that nl divided by l to the d goes to that row. And I use it as a trial state for the minimum here, okay? I just plug it as a trial state. And then of course I get an upper bound. It's since I'm plugging a trial state, and I conclude that the limb soup is less than E of S rho to the one plus S over D minus mu rho. And so if I now minimize over rho, I get that the limb soup is less than the minimum of a rho, and I have the limb inf is bigger, so they are all equal. And I have shown uh, the, the existence of this limit and the value of the limit. And then the argument for N is essentially the same. Okay, so that's very easy. Okay, so this is, so you should uh, just interpret this as a way of constructing one very special sequence of integers going to infinity, okay, which have more properties. Okay, and then we will study this sequence. So why am I telling you this? That's because now I want to discuss the positions of the points. Okay, so in my previous theorems, here and so on, I discussed the energy. So I told you that the energy per unit volume exists, it's independent on the way you compute it. And I told you we know the value in some cases, and then I told you the conjecture about the value. But that's only about energy. I would like now to concentrate on the points themselves. Okay, I would like to show that they converge to a lattice. Okay, this was never proved. It's completely open. Nobody was able to show this converges to a lattice. But what I can prove is that it converges to something. So now I will concentrate on what the points are doing. Okay, and for this, it's much easier to discuss the grand canonical problem because there are more properties and I'm going to use this property. So how am I going to use the property? So here is the trick. So let me consider, so let me take a domain omega. 
and a minimizer for this uh, grand canonical problem. So I call capital N. So I'm fixing some mu. Okay. Mu is going to be the one which I want to reach some density rho. And then I just uh, minimize over N. Okay. And I'm calling, calling capital N the minimizer. Very good. So now I have these points in omega, and they minimize this, both of our positions and over n. The fact they minimize also the number of points allows me to get some information if I remove points or if I add points, which I was not able to do before. So what I do is I remove one point. I remove one point, say xj0, and then I say that uh, the energy minus mu n must go up. And if you write what it means, when you say the energy must go up, you will discover that this gives you a, an upper bound on the interaction between the point and all the other points. Because that's exactly the missing term in this sum when I remove one point. So that will tell you that the sum over all the points different from J0 of one over xj minus xj0 to the s has to be less or equal than mu. Okay, and this must be true for all points. So that gives you an upper bound on the interaction between any points and the other points. From this, you deduce immediately that the points cannot be too close to each other. In fact, you deduce that the minimal distance between the points has to be at least mu to the minus one over x. Okay, so the points cannot be too close for a minimizer, for a grand canonical minimizer, and we know the distance, it's mu to the minus one over x, okay? So immediately we get some minimal distance between the points by looking at what is happening if we remove one point. But then we use the fact that this thing must go up if we remove one point. Now you can also add one point. So let me add one point at some x somewhere in omega. And then if you write what it means, what you get, you will see that this tells me that this sum must go up at least by mu. Okay, so now this gives me a lower bound on the potential which is generated by this point. What's the consequence of this bound? Well, this tells me that I cannot have very large holes in my system because imagine that I have a huge, huge ball where I have nobody. Then let me take X to be at the center of that ball. That's the picture here. Okay, so let me assume that there is a huge ball where there's no point in omega. And let me take X in the center of that ball. Then I know that all the other points are outside of the ball. And I also know that the minimal distance between these points is bounded by mu to the minus one over I mean, by scaling, I can always assume mu is one. Okay, so I have a huge ball where I have nobody except that X in the middle. And then I have points far away with a minimal distance to each other. It's not very hard to see that this sum here is comparable to the integral. Right? You just replace the points by some little balls, average a little bit something. The sum is going to be comparable to the integral, but this integral is one over R to the S minus D. S is bigger than D. Okay, and so this is definitely very small if R is too large. Okay, and this must be at least mu. And so this is how you conclude that there cannot be any empty ball of radius proportional to mu to the minus one over S in your system. Okay, so the conclusion is that the minimizer of your problem, the points cannot get too close and the points cannot be too far in the way that they, there can't be any big hole. And this is all in terms of that mu that you fixed. And let me remind you that mu is also a function of rho, right? You can, because you can invert the, the problem. So I'm thinking of fixing mu in terms of, of rho. And so you can compute everything in terms of, uh, of rho. What do we conclude from this? Well, we conclude that we can pass to the limit, right? Because we have points. So in the limit, we will have infinitely many points, but there can't be any big hole. They can't be too close. So definitely by compactness, we can pass to the limit and get infinitely many points, 
which are not too close to each other everywhere in space and which do not leave any big hole everywhere in space. Okay, so in a way, you get an infinite minimizer of your energy. So of course, it's very good to, to know that we can pass to the limit for the points, but we would like to say that they are really minimizing the energy because for any fixed uh, uh, omega, they do minimize the energy. The obvious problem is that the energy is infinite, okay? So uh, when I look at my infinitely many points in the whole space, I can't quite say that they minimize the energy because the energy is infinite. But what, what I can say is to say that they, they minimize the energy in the sense that if I take my points and then I move just a few of them or I delete a few of them, then the energy must go up. And uh, such a local deformation, if you like, it's very easy to pass the limit. And uh, that's the next theorem. So here is the theorem. So you fix any mu positive, then in the thermodynamic limit, after extraction of a subsequence, you can obtain from the grand canonical problem an infinite collection of points, which are not too close to each other and do not leave big holes, and minimize the grand canonical free energy, I should say, under local deformation. What does it mean? That's the picture. Okay, so now I have infinitely many points, and I want to say that. Uh, so I take a very large ball of any size, there it is, and then I allow to change only the points in that ball. So I can move them or I can add some, I can delete some, okay, but I'm only changing the points in that ball. And I say that the energy must go up. The energy is infinite, but if you write this, in, this infinite energy, you will see that the infinity is only due to the energy of the points outside. Okay, and when you write the difference between uh, the old energy and the energy of the points which you've moved, then this energy of the point, points outside of the ball appears on both sides. So what you do, you just cancel this infinite constant and you arrive at this characterization that for any ball, the points inside the, this ball solve this minimum, okay, which is a little bit of the same kind as what we had before. So there is the interaction between the points in the ball, mu times the number of points in the ball. But of course, the points inside, they also see all the points outside which we have fixed. Okay, so it looks a little bit complicated. I'm sorry, but it's very easy. It's just saying that when you have infinitely many points, the way to define a minimizer is just by looking at local deformations and writing the difference of uh, the deformed points minus uh, uh, the initial points and remarking that he's just finite uh, thanks to the fact that you only get convergent series because you know that these distances between the points. Okay, so this is what it means to be a minimizer of the problem in the whole space. So this is what it means to be an infinite equilibrium configuration of the risk gas at a given uh, pot chemical potential mu. Okay. Uh, to my surprise, I could never find uh, this uh, concept of uh, infinite equilibrium configuration in the literature. So they are very similar characterizations at positive temperature, in particular, what's called the DLR condition due to uh, the Rochin and Ford and Gudel. But uh, at zero temperature, I don't know why this was never written. It's, I mean, it's not a very difficult theorem. It's just uh, some compactness argument and you will find the proof in the paper. Very good. So what can we say about this infinite equilibrium configurations? So the first thing we can say is that they solve essentially the same problem as before in the ball, except that you have this additional potential here, which is the potential due to the points outside the ball. But these points, sorry, these points are have a minimal distance to each other and we have a short range potential, S is bigger than D. And so this is a very small effect. So this potential will only be seen by the points close to the boundary. But when you go very, 
very much toward the center of your ball, and this potential really becomes negligible. And so you can actually show that this problem with this external potential is essentially the same, this minimum, as the initial problem in the ball up to this explicit error term. And from this, you can conclude many interesting things. So you can conclude that any infinite equilibrium configuration as before has the average density rho of mu, which is the one I defined when I did this limit. Okay, because of the same the similar property as here, as well as the average energy per unit volume E times rho to the one plus S over D. Okay, so if you give me any infinite equilibrium configuration of points defined as before, I know they exist, okay, then they must have the density rho of mu and they must have the energy per unit volume E times rho to the one plus S over D. Now, the, the real, I would say, the real uh, formulation of the crystallization conjecture is that all such equilibrium configurations are lattices. Uh, to my knowledge, this was never proved. Uh, this is uh, much stronger than the conjecture at the level of the energy, which was proved in dimension one, eight, and 24. But even in dimension one, I think it's not known that all such equilibrium configurations are lat lattices. I expect that it's not very complicated, but I don't think it's been written. Okay. So an important remark is that these infinite equilibrium configurations, which are minimizers under local deformations, are definitely never unique. Because if you have one, we know we have some. So if you take one, then if you rotate it or translate it, it's still a, an infinite equilibrium configuration because our potential is invariant on the rotation and translations. Okay, so this is a clear manifestation of symmetry breaking. So there is a symmetry breaking occurring in our problem. And we see it from the fact that we have such infinite equilibrium configuration. So those configurations exist, and I think it would be very nice to study them uh, more, so more carefully and uh, try to prove the crystallization conjecture for such infinite configuration. So now you will tell me, oh, you use this current canonical uh, setting, but what can you say in the original setting? So what's called the canonical setting. So if I fix rho instead of fixing this mu, so everything works the same, but somehow it's more complicated because remember what we did to do the proof to show that the points were very nicely placed. What we did was to remove one point or add one point. So if you want to get the same theorem for the, the, the initial E, the original E, the one I started with, okay? So this E of N omega, then you have to estimate the cost of adding or removing one point. So you have to prove this lemma that the cost of adding or removing one point is bounded away from uh, below and above by some constant. Okay, and this constant will play the role of mu. And once you've proved this lemma, then everything goes through and then you can prove a similar theorem as before. Okay, but you have to prove this lemma and that was essentially free for us in the grand canonical problem. Let me mention that the difference actually is believed to converge to k times the mu of rho. So if I look at n plus k minus e of n, and uh, it must be also easy, but I also didn't find it uh, proved in the literature. Okay, so it's essentially the same for the initial problem, but it's more complicated technique. So conclusion. So in the short French case, one can define infinite equilibrium configurations, which are minimizers of the infinite energy in the sense that the energy must go up if I do local deformations, but local, but of any size. We know that, that such infinite equilibrium configurations exist because we know that they, we can get them by doing a, a thermodynamic limit. And we expect them to be lattices in a low dimension. 
We've seen that it is easier and actually equivalent to work with a grand canonical model, where instead of fixing the average number of points, we adjust it indirectly using the dual variable mu, which is called the chemical potential. Everything I told you at zero temperature can be generalized to positive temperature. And in fact, everything I told you works the same for general short range potentials. Many proofs I gave you or many proofs you will find in the paper are easier because our potential is positive. Okay, but nevertheless, everything is true in a similar manner. If you have a general short range potential, it might just be a little bit more complicated. At positive temperature, you don't get infinite configuration of points, but you get random point processes. So if you like a probability measure over infinite uh, configuration of points. And um, then usually people do not prove uh, uh, bounds on the minimal distance and holes uh, in a probabilistic way, but they instead bound what's called correlation functions. And then there's also a mu of rho, which is well defined and continuous. But uh, at positive temperature, it is not necessarily one to one. Okay, so you know, at zero temperature, for any mu, there's a rho, for any rho, there's a mu. It's a one to one map. But at positive temperature, it's not necessarily one to one, uh, which is a manifestation of uh, phase transitions. And then the, the, the fact that they minimize the energy locally is replaced by some um, equation at positive temperature. So either the TLR or some other equation. So this is all I wanted to tell you about the short range case at zero temperature. So the construction of infinite equilibrium configurations, the definition of what it means, the fact that they exist, and then the a crystallization conjecture for such infinite configurations, which to my knowledge has never been solved. So I would like to use my last uh, five minutes or so to uh, start the long range case. Okay, so now we would like to do the same. So everything I told you is kind of classical or not very difficult, although maybe it's hard to locate in the literature, but you will find all the references in my paper. Now we would like to do the same in the long range case. And now everything becomes really much more complicated, but we will try to follow the same path. So the first thing that we try to do is uh, to look at the energy. And this is exactly what uh, Hong, uh, Hong asked me uh, last time, sorry, when he told me, yeah, yeah, but this is not going to work at uh, when S is less than B because the energy is not going to behave like the volume or like the number of points. So here is the, the theorem, it's a very old theorem. Okay, so let's do the same as before. So you take omega a nice domain, okay? And let's scale it. Let's work at density one because there's also an exact scaling. Okay, so I take big omega to be N to the one over D times little omega. Okay, little omega is one, a nice domain, say. Then when I minimize the same quantity as before, the energy does not behave like N, but it behaves like N to the two minus S over D. Okay, so it grows faster than N because now S is less than D. So you see that when S is equal to D, I recover exactly N, although uh, the result is not quite true at S equals D. In this case, you get a log, an additional log. Okay, but there is a transition from order n when s is bigger than d to n to the two minus s over d when s is less than d. You see it's compatible. Okay, but the energy blows up really too fast and one can identify the leading term exactly. Okay, it's this minimum uh, here of our all uh, probability measures in omega of uh, this uh, Riss uh, energy, which is called the the risk capacity of omega, okay? And now in most, I mean, if S is very small, actually the, the, the optimal omega will be supported on the boundary. And one can relate the shape, uh, sorry, not the optimal omega, the optimal mu, okay? So the optimal equilibrium measure, it's called, 
the optimal mu will live on the boundary for Coulomb, for instance. It will not live on the boundary when S is bigger than D minus two, but it will always live on the boundary when S is less or equal than D minus two. And this has actually the effect that the points, they will all escape to the boundary. So here is the picture. So when S is bigger than D and you minimize your energy, the points are kind of well placed in your domain and you really get, uh, I mean, points at a certain uh, density. So you have a finite number of points per unit volume. But when S is less than D, they hate each other very much because of this long range. So your potential de decreases too slow at infinity when a rise to the S is not integrable anymore. It's too slow. And these points, they hate each other and they just prefer to be close to each other. And they will not feel your domain omega at all. And you will not get infinite uh, configuration of points. Your omega will end up being essentially empty. Okay, so nothing is working. And we have to uh, find a solution to avoid this escape to the boundary of the point. Okay. So what's the solution? So, I mean, what we could do is to just look at what's happening at the boundary. That's one solution. But then somehow you were, I mean, you wanted to work in dimension D and if suddenly the points get uh, escaped to the boundary, you will end up being in dimension D minus one. And de depending on the value of S, maybe the dimension will further decrease. Okay, so this is not good. You could do it. Well, this is not good. So we want to work in dimension D, okay? So let's force the point. Let's make sure that the point do not escape to the boundary and stay in the middle of the domain. So the usual way of doing this is by what's adding what's called a uniform background, okay? So we are going to change the energy which we minimize by adding an external potential. There it is which corresponds to a uniform background of an opposite charge, if you like, over the whole of omega, okay? And uh, so this uniform background has a very long history. Um, it's a physical way of renormalizing the energy because for instance, in the core of stars, as I explained to you, then uh, the, the atoms are really ionized. And so the, the nuclei, they really move in an essentially uniform background of electrons. So uh, for charged particles, it's very natural to assume that there's a uniform background. This model is sometimes called the jellium model because it's a little bit like putting a little bit of, uh, I mean, a lot of jelly in your domain to slow down your points, make sure they don't escape and um, make sure they, they, they are stuck in this jelly. Anyway, so here is the new energy, okay? so. We will have the same double sum as before, so sum of our pairs. And then we have the interaction between the points and the uniform background. Okay, so it's just the sum of the points of a certain constant rho b, that's the density of the uniform background. And then I integrate, okay, that's the interaction between the points and the background. And then it's very natural to add this constant. It's just a constant. It doesn't do anything to the minimizers. Okay, but it's a huge constant. So it's going to renormalize the energy in the proper way. Okay, which is just the density of the background squared divided by two, and then the Ries energy of the background. So I'm thinking here that I have points and a background, and I'm counting the energy of the points, the energy of the background, and the interaction energy between the points and the background. And the lemma, which uh, we will prove uh, in two days, so on Friday, I'm gonna stop now because it's time, is that this background thing, which was introduced by physicists essentially for Coulomb, works for all S. Okay, so this way of renormalizing the energy works for all S in the sense that the energy is going to behave like the volume now like the number of points and the points they will live in the domain as we want them to do. Okay, there are many open problems. Not all values of S have been uh, covered by, uh, by mathematical results so far, as I will explain, but 
we expect at least that it should work for all s and definitely stability works for all s between minus two and the dimension. Let me remind you that uh, there is this uh, threshold minus two. Okay, it works for s equals zero as well, no problem. And this allows to stabilize the system and make sure that the points do not escape to the boundary. So now with this new model, uh, we will be able to study what the points are doing. We will be able to construct infinite uh, equilibrium configurations a little bit as before, even though you will see that it's much more technical. So this we will discuss on Friday. And thank you very much for your attention. Um, 